Uh, it's so nice to see this many people. We've never had this many people in our office at once. So um, I'm gonna play with this audio a little bit just to make sure I'm doing this correct because we have a lot of videos that are vintage here. The quality's not gonna be good. Um, so first, when I was out to talk about chaos, first, thank you so much to Creative Mornings, uh, also to some of my team, to the whole company for allowing us to have this. We have a lot of deadlines going on right now and people are very busy. I do wanna welcome you all to Sharpsburg. I don't know how many people have never been to Sharpsburg before, never stopped here, not driven through. All right, so that's a lot. So Sharpsburg's uh, changing. I encourage you to look over here, to look at Sharpsburg and Aetna, and everyone knows about Milldale. Uh, we moved here from the Strip District uh, about six months ago, seven months ago, um, to make a transition, and we're one of the largest employers here. Um, we have a good relationship with the community. Um, and yeah, so I encourage you to do some walking around and take a look at what's there. Thanks. So I was asked to talk about chaos. Um, so I had to figure out what chaos was. Actually, Arturo, the designer who worked on that flyer, probably did more research into chaos than I did. Um, he had shared with me so all his findings are kind of interesting. Uh, and what I think is most interesting about chaos is it has to do with getting older. So for me, uh, I've always lived a fairly chaotic life or what from the outside could be perceived as chaotic. And I think with chaos, there's always order. And order comes um, after only having the visibility that you have as you're getting older, one of the only good qualities of getting older is having that ability to reflect on your life and try to perceive what was probably imperceivable in the moment. So I've been trying to do that for myself. I'm gonna share with you a little bit of my background, my story, um, not because I think it's unique or you should be impressed by it. I just wanna share it because I think it lends itself to an understanding of what chaos is and why it's valuable, why we should live in a, in a chaotic world that allows us to create something new um, that was unplanned for and unpredictable. So first, I wanna be really clear, I am not an expert on anything. Uh, I'm not, I'm not here to tell you how to live your life, what decision to make. Uh, I'm not a musician, I'm not an artist, I'm not an educator, I've played those parts in different points of my life, but I'm not an expert at anything. I've surrounded myself with really talented people as, as many times as I can, and I, I do that to this day. Uh, what you're gonna see when I talk to you today, I'm gonna be very honest, I'm gonna share a lot of work with you uh, that I did when I was 18, 19, 20 years old, sometimes even younger. Uh, unlike Judge Kavanaugh, I am full of contradictions. Um, uh, I am a little controversial, and uh, I, I hope that I don't upset some of you, but some of the work may. Uh, I'm most likely a sellout. Um, I've been called that by former close friends. I've accepted that. I live a hypocritical life. I say one thing and do another very often. I live a life of change. Even our company is a testament to that. I constantly want to change and reinvent, and that can be difficult for some. Um, especially you mentioned coming from a punk rock background that typically celebrates uh, consistency. Um, people who commit to something for a very long time, I am non-committal. Um, so I'm gonna tell you about a little, some of the things that were non-committal. And I know some of you from the past, which is kind of nice to, to see you here today. Uh, so I did, I grew up in a primarily white suburb, Greensburg, Pennsylvania, went to Hemfield High School. Uh, I thought every day, like most of my friends, that I wanted to leave Pittsburgh and specifically leave Greensburg. I didn't want to be in this town. Um, I escaped through music and through comic books. I would come to the city and go to Ides or Bem and Wilkinsburg and, um, you know, and wanted to be in bands. I had no musical talent, um, but I wanted to be in a band. I started my first band when I was 16 years old. Um, it evolved over the years, but it continued probably until uh, I played my last show about a year ago. So it continued for a long time. The point was, what I started to do was get involved in an underground music scene which opened my world up beyond Greensburg. I started playing my first shows out of town, out of Greensburg, out of state when I was 17. Played my first shows around the country when I was 18, toured the country when I was 18, and toured Europe when I was 20. And was able to put out records, um, design record covers, I started a record label. Um, all of that allowed me to look at all of my different interests. I was able to design, I was able to become a project manager, I was able to orchestrate tours. It was a different time period, all my friendships, all my relationships I merged and uh, evolved in that underground scene we were done through letters um, and sometimes phone calls. We would handwrite letters back and forth. I still have a collection of letters I've kept since I was 16 years old. And so the relationships were personal. And there's a story about this that I can tell later, um, how it evolved into some of the growth that you see at Deep Local. This is what I looked like around 1998, um, pretty different than now. And this is what we sounded like. And this is a little bit self-indulgent. <laughs> Don't worry, it's only 12 seconds long. And if I can actually skip ahead here. I had many different hairstyles, including this one. Oh, it's, it may or may not play. 
that was evolved after a three month tour with probably three showers. Um, so, my freshman year roommate will tell you that I showered maybe twice my freshman year at Carnegie Mellon. Um, I actually wandered by campus once when he was giving a presentation to an orientation counselor talking to incoming students and he was dressed as me playing a role to talk about how difficult your freshman roommate can be. So that was <laughs> um, I walked in on day one and put my Go Vegan poster up on the wall and it kind of solidified the end of the relationship. So. Why I'm, why I'm talking about that at all is like, what, why I wanted to be in a band was not about being in a band. I was not a musician. My peers were great. They were talented musicians. The band over the years devolved. I was uncomfortable standing in front of people. I would perform with my back to the audience. I built my own electronic uh, noise machines and slowly the concert would devolve into competitions between my band and myself. I would take over the sound. I would piss off the audience. I can still read negative reviews on YouTube of myself and my performances. Um, I lived with that. I learned to develop thick skin as well. I learned a lot in that band. But I got sick of talking um, specifically to that punk rock audience. I felt like it was insulated. We all had the same interests. We all were part of the same movements. Um, we all cared about the same things, and I didn't know why. I didn't know why I cared, and I wanted to be, I, I've always kind of lived in this gray area, and I wanted to be doing something else. So around 1997, I founded an art group. I was at Carnegie Mellon, I was studying art, and I was self-taught to a very low level compared to what my company's able to do now in electronics and programming. I wanted to make things that I could put into the world that were real. Uh, and I wanted to understand technology, so I would learn what I could, and I would take whatever classes I could. I founded an art group, that did in fact almost get me arrested, and I'll share with you how several times, um, and charged with a federal crime. Uh, and I found an art group because I wanted to work around people that couldn't, my ideas were bigger than, than my own skill set. I couldn't do what I wanted to, to do without having peers work with me. So I got really good at collaborating, and I found friendships with people that were engineers. So I've been working with engineers since around 1997, and I still do that to this day. So the art group itself, I'm gonna show you some work. I apologize again, please bear with me. Um, this one's not so bad, at least if I don't talk to you about what the game was. So one of the first, the art group became known as a hardware hacking group, so it was called the Carbon Defense League, and one of the first projects we did was hacking the Nintendo Game Boy. So you have to kind of put yourself back into 1998. At that time, Nintendo Game Boy was the leading selling video game console in the world. Um, at that time as well, it was very difficult. If I were to walk down the street as an activist with a flyer and hand it to a child under age 18, in many cases I could be arrested for violating community standards laws. However, video game companies could produce any content they want and distribute it to, to, to kids without any oversight. So I, my goal of my art group was to create access to media that wasn't there before for activists and others. How do I reclaim media so that other people can use it? This is a different time than we're at right now. It's a very different time. It's kind of amazing to see what's changed. This project we started with the Nintendo Game Boy itself. This is an example of what's called reverse stealing. We would buy video games, Nintendo Game Boy cartridges from stores. We would take them, we would replace the ROM chip for those uh, engineers here, the memory chip with an EEPROM, a programmable memory chip. We wrote our own game our own game with our own content. We wrote our own compiler to compile it to Dot Game Boy, a proprietary language, and we would upload it to the cartridge. We would go back to the store and put it on the shelf so that a child going to buy Blades of Steel would instead get our game. <coughs> Um, all I'll say about our game content, I have a little bit of shots of it here, um, there's no audio here, is that it uh, related to the writings of Wilhelm Reich. So for those that know Wilhelm Reich, um, you'll know what I'm talking about, I won't go any deeper. Um, so anyhow, what we did with this was we wanted not just to create our own games, we wanted to open it up as a platform. So we wrote our own um, uh, instructions, we created a book called Child is Audience that we released in uh, three different languages. Uh, including a CD-ROM with all the software, the electronics, the instructions, the schematics, so that people could build, do this themselves in different countries. I would often at this time travel around and speak at hacker, hacker conferences. I spoke at, um, again, for those engineers, at conferences like Hope, Hackers on Planet Earth, alongside people like Kevin Mitnick. Um, we talked about this work. I would also go to the band shows, and this world started to merge, and I would teach people how to reverse engineer technology. <clears throat> An example of that is this right here. This is a really quick Skillshare workshop. 
getting very old time, but this was a project that we developed to allow to get people into electronics that had never touched a circuit board before, to allow people to engage in reverse engineering. What we found was that when people took cameras uh, uh, for recycling into like a Safeway or a grocery store to have their cameras and their film processed, again, I feel so old talking about this stuff, that actually used to happen. <clears throat> we would be able to get all the disposable cameras back after the film canister had been removed and we could turn disposable cameras with a slight hack with no soldering at all into miniature projectors. So by placing film or any writing that we wanted on a transparency behind uh, the aperture and then taking the flash from the disposable camera and then wiring it if we wanted to with a, a simple 5 by 5 timer circuit, which we didn't have to do, you could basically deploy this into the world as like a little miniature projector. So a miniature hack wasn't about the project, it was about getting people hands-on with reverse engineering. And we would do those as workshops in combination with the band and in combination with the art group. So we kind of started to blend those worlds together. Um, the Child is Audience book that I released, uh, that we released, was done uh, through uh, AK Press and Artmark. Artmark is a legal corporation that uses the, the laws that protect corporations in this country to protect somewhat deviant art groups. So um, rather than suing me, you would have to sue Artmark. Uh, Artmark's famous for other projects like the BLO, similar to what I was talking about, the Barbie Liberation Organization, where they uh, swap the voice boxes of Talking G.I. Joe and Talking Barbie and put them back to st in store shelves as well so that G.I. Joe would say math is hard. And the reason I bring that up is if you look at this work and why I was creating this, this art group at all is I, I have a, a really strong belief in what art is and what artists are, and I think they have the ability to perceive things in the world different th differently than others. That can be through their own behavior, through how they're wired, through their experiences, but they allow us to look at everything from a rose to a political sign to an advertisement and think something differently about it than we would on our own. They encourage us to think. That's what artists do. So you have to look at the world and find a way to perceive it in some different way. So keep that in mind as I show you this project. So. When I did that work, um, it, was, it, was, it was exciting, but it was mostly to either a punk or art audience. Those are the genres. And I was frustrated that the work was not seen by anyone outside of that audience, and I wanted to find a way to reach a larger audience. At that time, this is around, the work I'm about to show you started in around 2003, I started to look at the internet. I knew enough to make a database and build websites, so I started to look at what are called website reams. How do I make a website that looks and feels like another website to kind of trick people uh, into you know, absorbing my content. So around this time, to set this up a little bit, this is a little bit longer video, it's a project called recode.com. We, um, at that time is when GM's Revolution ad campaign came out. It's when Washington Mutual Bank used images of Che Guevara to advertise low finance charge checking accounts to people in New York. It's when, um, William Shatner was, uh, the spokesperson for Priceline.com that'll encourage you to name your own price. Um, that this was a whole new form of, uh, of, of liberation and um, for naming your own price. So we thought we should carry these arguments to their logical, logical extreme. What if we made this stuff real? What if we carried true on William Shatner's promise and allowed people to name their own price? The other contextual point to note is this is also when self-scanning checkouts at counters to scan barcodes and checkout were first starting to be tested uh, in the country. Oh, wait, no, I'm gonna go back to this one. Here we go. News 10 and 6 continue. News 10 investigates. Until now, they've been anonymous, the men who created a website that has drawn fire from some of the biggest retailers in the entire country. The website is called recode.com, where you could go copy, then substitute barcode labels. The creators call it political satire. Priscilla Russ says corporate giants call it stealing. And I don't think it comes as a big surprise to any of us sitting here. I mean, when it comes to switching barcode labels on its products, Corporations aren't laughing. However, the fuss is generating more publicity than these two anonymous cyber activists could ever have dreamed of. Anonymous until they agreed to meet with us today. You might want to search for Walmart. You might want to search for Kmart. You might want to search for crackers. You might want to search for um, under $5.99. It took two days to create Recode.com. It's a whole new age of consumer power. Recode.com is fashioned after Priceline.com. You know the website where you can go and name your own price? Millions of beautiful people have named their own price and save a lot of bread on the things they want and need. Only at Recode, you can change the original price with a new barcode. How? Well, during the five-minute video, you'll see a person armed with a downloadable data collection sheet writing down barcode information to be entered into Recode's national database where it can be reprinted. Simply print your barcodes onto label paper available at most office supply or electronic stores. 
and cut out your codes in preparation for recoding. We encourage our customers to recode brand name items with generic item codes. Price sticker switching has gone on forever. We're not advocating switching price stickers. Um, <laughs> we're taking such a hilarious approach, and if you watch our video, it's pretty, uh, from our perspective, it's understandable that this is humorous. This joke has apparently been lost on corporate giants like Walmart. April 2nd, Walmart lawyers sent this letter, charging RICO with encouraging and facilitating theft and fraud, demanding it immediately shut down. It's not live anymore. We, we voluntarily removed it from the web last night. But Mona Gola from Price Chopper says that's not enough. It's not only encouraged people to do something illegal, but it's enabled them to do it. So for however long that the information was available to people, uh, the damage was done. Mona Golub says Price Chopper is investigating, and she says the FBI is investigating along with the Kellogg Corporation. Meanwhile, on Friday, Rico said they had 90,000 hits in one hour thanks to the national and international exposure that Rico is getting. But they're not worried that there's going to be any legal action? They didn't say they were not worried. <laughs> they I think they are a little bit concerned about what's uh, what's to come at this point. Yeah, I don't think the corporation going to go after the money. They might want a little punishment to set an example. Okay. So um, <laughs> what was going on at this time was kind of interesting. It's when the federal government started federal mandatory minimums for certain uh, crimes. And one of them was aiding and abetting theft across state lines. So uh, I got to know that lawyer, uh, probably a first year attorney who sent that cease and desist letter. As, you, as anyone that works in the space knows cease and desist letters are common. Um, they don't necessarily mean anything. They're just threatening letters to try to create a chilling effect. Um, but I was 22, 20, I don't know how old I was, young. Um, and I was a little bit nervous at that time. So uh, we did work with uh, the organization Artmark, another, they evolved into an organization called the Yes Men. So we worked with them to get some advice um, on kind of how to handle the situation. Um, we also talked to the EFF uh, out of San Francisco, a group of lawyers that work in down in the digital domain to kind of help with, uh, you know, just making sure we had some legal advice on what to do. The problem was that Walmart uh, was claiming, we actually talked to both Walmart's legal representatives as well as their PR representatives, and they didn't have consistent statements. So one was claiming that Walmart uh, had proof and two kids that were willing to testify that they had used our system to reverse and to steal objects based in North Carolina Therefore, we had facilitated theft across state lines. They would testify against us. They wouldn't have done it otherwise. So we did remove this. Um, we were able to use a lot of press, though. We used our network um, to get press for this. So we took that letter. We put it everywhere. We had t-shirts that had that letter printed. The lawyer had to change her email address and phone number at the law firm. Um, I think she actually kind of liked us by the end. But uh, anyhow, that was just kind of a precursor to another project. And let me step back here. So that got me into the space of understanding press manipulation. I talked to a lot of journalists around that time. And I started to understand how people pick up news stories and also refuse to uh, investigate details. So I knew that I just had to create something that fit in the news cycle. And I went on later to teach a course at CMU called Parasitic Media that, that, that also had students receiving uh, cease and desist letters. That course is no longer taught there. Um, <clears throat> so uh, around the time, um, God, I'm dating myself here, this election was George Bush, Sean Kerry. Is that the election? Um, we wanted to do something about the election uh, at the time. And so we used a similar approach. We started a website since 2004 called fthevote.com. You can imagine what the F stood for. Um, and uh, fthevote.com was a website that was made to look originally like Rock the Vote, um, except the pledge sheets here, the assumption was that liberals were hotter than conservatives and that uh, liberals would sign up, they would create their own profile and say what they're willing to do with a conservative in exchange for the conservative agreeing to vote for anyone but George Bush. So um, this is a little bit of sna a snapshot of here. Definitely. They want you to vote against the president, and they've got an offer you won't believe. Good evening, and welcome to 10 News at 11. I'm Carolyn Donaldson. And I'm Chuck Farrell, trading sex for votes. That's one of Pittsburgh based to get people not to vote for George W. Bush in the November election. 10 News reporter Emily Nitesik was at their rally in State College earlier tonight and has more. They call themselves F the Vote, and they're traveling around in this I have to pause to tell you. If you've watched Making a Murderer, this woman has now made an appearance. She's uh, one of the chief newscasters throughout that and show. And trying to get people to... It may sound ridiculous, but these folks aren't laughing about their message to try and vote President Bush out of office. They do admit their tactics are a bit skewed, but they were looking for a way to get youth involved in the 2004 presidential election. What started as a website that played off of MTV's Rock of the Vote F the Vote uses sex as humor to get the message across. Conceived of it as a joke. 
Um, it has it has since gained legitimacy um, simply because people choose to believe that something this absurd could be real. So they travel around in this van, complete with a bed in the back, and hand out buttons, blinds, and even condoms to anyone who's willing to listen. But as far as actually trading sex for votes, well, according to the F the Vote models, that never really happens. I think it's a really fun idea, and I'm highly in support of this kind of, you know, endeavor to get the youth motivated to think about getting Bush out of office in any way, but um, the fact of the matter is, I don't think I could ever actually let a conservative touch me. <laughs> Maryland and is in town dropping his son off at Penn State, and even though he's voted Republican in the last few presidential elections, he finds F the vote refreshing. They're having a little bit of fun, they're making a few points, and uh, they're not pulling off a big over act. But while this van tour is supposed to be fun and just a way to get people to stop and think, not everyone is laughing. In fact, some find it offensive. Well, I think it's horrible. These, the soldiers are over in Iraq right now, freeing uh, a country from a horrible dictator. Uh, and they want you to vote against uh, an administration that's worked very hard uh, for a good effort to free people. This van will leave here tomorrow morning and head to the Republican National Convention in New York City where the F to vote people will once again try and trade sex for votes against President Bush. In State College, Emily Matesic, 10 News. For those that know Bike Pittsburgh, there is a Scott Ricker cameo there that he's probably very embarrassed as the executive director of Bike Pittsburgh now. <clears throat> well, I hate that that exists still. Um, so, uh, what can I say about that? Oh, this is uh, Keith Oberman talking about me. Anyway, if you thought that was absurd, another website claims, emphasize the word claims, that it is offering to arrange liberal dates who will have sex with conservatives if the conservatives pledge in writing not to vote for George Bush. Promoter Nathan Martin claimed this is legit says he will have a bus filled with willing models of both genders going through the swing state <coughs> of Ohio next week. The name of this website and alleged votes for sex organization will be displayed prominently on the side of the bus. We cannot say that name here, but it sounds kind of like rock the vote. The only evidence that this is for real is the group's claim that it completed three such transactions in Florida last week and one more in New Mexico, and presumably anybody making that stuff up would make up better numbers than that. One of the actors a newly admitted to, if not exactly new facet of politics, is Mickey Kaus, contributor to Slate.com. Mr. Kaus, good evening. Good evening. Well, I've heard of naked politics before, but this is ridiculous. Does this, does this premise sound right to you, that a, a voter, in this case a Republican voter, would trade his or her vote for sex? Uh, no, it sounds self-contradictory. I'm going to cut uh, ahead of that really quick. So what ended up happening with that is we did have about $2,000 to fund that whole project. Uh, I was working, this will get me in trouble, I was working at CMU at the time, that was run on Carnegie Mellon servers. Um, we, uh, I took a lot of phone calls uh, in CFA. Uh, I was attacked on air by Michael Medved, Medved by Bill O'Reilly. Um, a lot of talk show radio morning calls, I was attacked. Um, I was attacked by both the left and the right for this project. Um, it really upset a lot of people. Uh, no one that I know of actually went through with this. However, an organization started in San Francisco that called themselves F the Vote West. They wanted to create a documentary, um, and they were requiring people to, they, they claimed that they were doing this for real and required absentee ballots and were actually uh, having sex for votes, um, uh, carrying through with my mission. And uh, what else happened? We met uh, Outcast this way. Uh, Andre from um, Outcast did an HBO special and invited us uh, to, to be on it. Uh, I sent one of my friends who's transgender to be there on behalf of fthevote.com. Um, and yeah, so basically what happened with that, not much. Uh, Ohio Board of Elections declared they would arrest me on site if we entered the state of Ohio. We didn't enter Ohio. We did go to the RNC in New York. Um, with that stopped over in State College. So what I learned from that was even larger kind of press control, um, how to tell and control a story. I think I did a better job controlling it there. Um, <clears throat> so fast forward, 
what did I not get out of that? So again, kind of trying to make this story make sense. Uh, after that, I, I knew that I, uh, I was excited that I had reached kind of a Main Street audience. I wanted to impact culture in some way, but I felt like it wasn't lasting. It was fleeting, it was, a, it was a spike that didn't really last and wasn't meaningful, and I wanted to do something else. I wanted to be challenged. I was a horrible teacher. Uh, I didn't have the patience to teach, so I knew I had to do something else. So I was encouraged to start a business while I was a researcher at CMU. I had $200, um, three of us pitched in 200 bucks, and we started a business located in East Liberty above the Shadow Lounge that was there. Uh, the only place that would give me a month-to-month -month rental it was $500 for 500 square feet. So um, we hacked our way into existence. My co-founders left within the first year, even though they're my friends, and I was left to decide what I wanted to do with my life. Um, I enjoyed what we were trying to do, and we raised some investment. Um, we couldn't figure out how to actually run a business. I wrote a lot of business plans. I was told many times that the company would fail because I couldn't stick to one thing with our business. Um, and we had a few people really locally that supported uh, us as a company. Uh, and in 2009, and this is where these stories connect a little bit, uh, I was called by a guy who used to be in punk bands, a band called To Dream of Autumn, who I knew when he was 16 years old. And I traveled around and showed an art project that Greg, our CTO, had worked on. Um, it was a small graffiti writing robot. He had seen that when we were, when I was probably 19 years old and he was 16 or 17. Uh, he had called me up and I didn't know how the advertising world worked. And at that time, that idea had been presented uh, to Nike uh, as we can do something like this. I got a call and seven weeks later we had created, Greg and I, uh, our companies together had created this project called the Nike Chalkbot. Uh, this is what that project kind of was. We built Chalkbot. Um, together so that people from everywhere can spread messages of hope and uh, cancer survival um, to, a, to a, the entire world at the Tour de France um, on the streets. It's a fully pneumatic robot friends working on the development of it so it's literally friends working together building a really cool thing that millions of people are going to be able to see and experience and interact with I'm gonna cut these all a little bit short so from that that project we were deep local was about six people five or six people some of them are still here today uh, it received a, a lot of awards a grand prize at Cannes, which is one of the largest awards in advertising we were the smallest company to do it. We were the first company doing robotics for advertising, and we realized there was an opportunity for us to do this. We started to work with ad agencies, ad agencies themselves. Uh, JetBlue had an all-you-can-jet pass at the time, so my, my then coworker, now wife, Heather and I booked an all-you-can-jet pass so for 28 days. We did four meetings a day and traveled from all the towns you see here. We treated it like a band tour, even created a band poster, um, and met with every company that we could. And that did about two years of business with us working under agencies, although we hated working under agencies. And we realized that um, uh, we just didn't see a future for our business there. We had grown to about 12 to 15 people, and then we made a collective decision that we were going to swear off that work. Yeah, we weren't going to continue to do it. Uh, and we were gonna try to work with brands directly and do our own thing and come up with our own creative concepts. Um, we had several projects that did that. This is one of them. I'll talk over this. So you can start to see some similarities here, but these were the Netflix socks and we had built these, uh, designed these, concept these, and built these with Netflix. I'll give you the short version. of socks that pause your TV when you fall asleep. They use an accelerometer when you're watching Netflix. has come up with this brilliant idea to help you, okay? company has invented socks that read your body to understand when you've fallen asleep. Netflix have come up with these socks that you wear. It monitors when you fall asleep. Not on your Christmas list just yet, but check this out. These are Get ready for this. So, this is really fascinating. <laughs> So we went on to do, um, and, and still continue to do, in, in marketing at least, uh, even though we're not an ad, ad agency, we were able to use, again, some of those same storytelling methods 
uh, because we don't create commercials, we don't create ads, um, we just put things into the world and ideas. Uh, and we've had four projects uh, get over a billion, our media impressions, four on Good Morning America, uh, for example. Uh, but then we grew up. So uh, the company is now almost 13 years old, we're uh, 12 years old, we're over 12 years old now. Um, it's the longest I've committed to anything in my life. Uh, and what I started to see with this business was that a lot of my friends work here and in my life there's always a collision between who my friends are and what I do for fun and for a living. They all kind of mash up. Um, so these are my best friends. And uh, we all got older. We bought houses and we had children and we got married. And um, it got scary to just think about running a company that just makes payroll uh, every month. So um, one thing that we did was, oh, that's my daughter. I, she is not on social media, so that's a back shot of her. Um, she's 19 months old and it very much changes your life. Everyone here that had children before me told me that and then to, I had to realize it myself, uh, to do it myself. But we sold to a multinational corporation. We sold to WPP, um, which is the largest holding company in advertising. They 100% acquired us a little over a year ago. Um, and it was, again, even in retrospect, one of the smartest things that we did. It created stability for the employees here. Uh, this is one of those things that I've, there's numerous that I can be called a sellout for, but my, I chose that my art right now is about trying to create a stable business environment where people can grow, grow families, ra uh, raise families, grow a life and be supported and change what they do during the day. I want everyone to be motivated and passionate and love what they get to do. Um, and, and we've been able to do that here. And I moved the company four times in 12 years. Um, it's hard to do that. We moved, uh, what you don't see here is we have a full shop on the first floor, um, 25 foot tall ceilings, maybe something like that, but uh, a full production shop that we moved to Sharpsburg, uh, which most people don't know where it is. Um, similar to when I started in East Liberty, most people, uh, when I would talk to investors, told, asked me why I was in East Liberty. Um, I stayed in East Liberty for probably the first five years. Then we moved to the Strip District when there were no tech companies there. Uh, we got priced out of there, just like we did East Liberty. Um, so we had to move again. And we started to look at where we could go. And we wanted to have an impact. We felt like in Pittsburgh, there was a time when we felt like our business meant something. Um, we started a place called Bayardstown Social Club that people used to go to. We were able to do things that we felt were uh, a part of the, the fabric. Um, we felt like that wasn't true anymore in the city. I didn't feel like it was true, that we were able to be impactful anymore. Um, the city had changed. There's a lot of tech companies. There's a lot going on. There's a lot of startups. Just go to the Ace Hotel uh, bar and hang out with the entrepreneurs. Um, so it changed. And uh, so we wanted to come somewhere where we could make a difference. I wanted to do that. And Sharpsburg became a place that we felt like we could be very impactful. Um, and, and we've already started to do that. Not just adding to the tax base here, but also kind of having a relationship with the community where we can start to change it. So um, that's why we ended up in Sharpsburg. So I know i got to wrap up. I'm going to try to bring this together for you, but here's what I've looked at. When you talk about getting older and looking back on your life and why you do all this stuff, a lot of things have changed. The responsibilities that I have have changed. Money, something I never cared about, has changed that I worry about much more. Uh, and battles. I've chosen to fight different battles than I chose to fight before. Uh, I've always lived in this kind of gray area that I think is very interesting to me. I've always wanted to surround myself with people that have a different perspective than my own, that challenge me to think differently. I'm always going to be passionate about my opinion. I'm always going to care a lot about it, but I want someone else to change my mind as quickly as possible, and then I want to accept that change and move on. Um, and this is what's important, what didn't. And I encourage you, why I'm sharing this is like there are many things in my past that probably made my parents cringe, that made them scared. I'm not even talking about most of them. Um, worried about whether or not I was going to be okay or that their child was going to be okay. And I think what's important with your friends, your family, your coworkers, it's to find what's important about the organization within that chaos. So to me, there were consistent character traits, and this is definitely applicable given the, the news that we all watched yesterday. While there are many things I've done in my past that I probably wanna, don't want to pull my daughter aside and tell her about, there's a consistent character trait and consistent behavior from the time I was 12 to the time I uh, stand here right now. These are things I cared about and the things that define me. Be first, get your ideas into the real world first. I, I, it, I don't care about ideas. I care about making them real. Everyone has ideas all of the time and we can all sit back and complain about someone else who made it first. Just be the person to make it first. Just try, just get started. Um, be remarkable. You know, always do something that you wanna talk about. Create a story that you wanna tell. Um, you know, live a life that's worth talking about. There's no reason to not do this, to, to find the thing that's different, that's unique, that makes it interesting for others and yourself, and be prolific. You know, build an identity. Those groups came together as an organization I called Hacktivist for a long time, and it was all about building an identity. 
uh, and spreading it and being known for something and always being perceived actually as much larger than we were. So be prolific. Be nice. Um, remember the world is full of humans. Uh, I run this company the same way I ran a band. I develop personal relationships with people. I think that every company out there is not just a company and the people that work at them, even the evil ones, aren't necessarily evil people. Uh, you have to develop a relationship with individuals and understand what motivates them, both because it professionally makes sense, but it's we're humans. Um, the world is full of humans. Businesses aren't real. Um, be passionate. Do what you care about and do it your way. I think that it is um, what's amazing about our company, and I'm not giving you a sales pitch, I just am kind of amazed by it every day, is that people that work their butts off here are working for one another, not for me. I know that. Um, there was a time when they probably worked for me, but now they work for one another, and that's because they're passionate about what they're doing, and that's the, the best way to run any organization, whether it's a band or a business. Um, and reinvent the wheel. You know, I hate being told what conventional wisdom is. I hate being told the way things are supposed to be done, or that's not how they're done, or this is how I know to do it. I value experience, but if you can't take that experience and turn it on its head, you're never going to invent. How can you invent when you create something that someone else already created? So I not built this company and made, never made any decision based on what someone else has done historically. We have no business model for what we're doing. Um, we're constantly just kind of plowing ahead and reinventing as we go, and we're comfortable with that. And then that works if you can be authentic, um, be honest, and be yourself. Uh, I'm, I always tell a real story. I'm probably, you know, faking the role as CEO right now, but uh, you know, tell that real story and be authentic and be honest, and you will find a way uh, to kind of live through all this stuff. Um, been able to even do do this band up until I got older. Instead of show you that, I'll put some audio in the background because one thing that we did with F the Vote, I've always enjoyed getting reactions. Um, so we're going to open this up to question and answer, but you can hear some of the phone calls and other people that I offended when we did FTheVote.com. Some audio here. Don't know if you guys knew, but uh, we're going to drop like 13 points in the polls. So that means that you guys are losing. Because you will be the president again. So, instead of fuck the vote, how about fuck the liberal? Sorry, I'm not the curse. Do you have a big one? I'll let you know. Hello, I'm calling for the girl you want, model 0159 from Pittsburgh. My name is Joe. And hey, no, hi, my name is Larry, and I'm in the Seattle area, and I'm inquiring about have to vote. Um, give me a call back. I don't have a model number or name. It's just for Green Eye. And, 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 uh, I'm actually a Bush supporter. I'm not afraid of anything that can find my vote. Unless there's any way you can get over right, yeah, yeah, I'm calling you less than four models. I'm going to go Rebecca, um, and Josh. Uh, These were almost exclusively men calling in, requesting model numbers, and honestly asking um, to meet. Are you fucking retarded? Because I think you are really fucking retarded. Stupid <laughs> fucking people. So that's what I got. So, um, yeah, any questions?